We are live, fellas. Hello, everyone, and welcome to Police Off the Cuff, Real Crime Stories. I'm so excited about this show tonight. We have retired first-grade detective Tommy Dades, who happens to be an organized crime expert. And we have a real organized crime expert in Larry Mazza, a made guy from the Colombo crime family. And guess what? These two guys grew up together in Brooklyn. Tommy Dades in Sunset Park and Larry Mazza in Gravesend. And guess what? They're still friends. They ran into each other when they were like 12 or 13 years old. And Larry said, if anyone should have become a wise guy or a thug, it was Tommy Diggs. I put that in my book. That's right. He was a, he was sporting a Tasmanian <laughs> devil tattoo at the age of 12. So Girl. without any further ado, I'd just like to welcome you guys to the show. Tommy Dades, Larry Mazza, welcome to Police Off the Cuff Real Crime Stories. Thanks so much. A pleasure to be here. And Tommy, I want you to know I don't wear a suit. <laughs> I don't really know who the wife is. I'm in the middle of a move, and my sister Marie told me you better have a yellow wall behind you. So I just drew some trophies up behind you. We had to hang a curtain because I got family over and they're in front of my computer. But I was going to wear sunglasses and a suit. But I, nah, I don't want to show Tommy up. <laughs> Guys, let's start where what was it like growing up in Brooklyn? back in the day when you guys were coming up? You want to go first time with me? Back in those days, um, well, we met we met before you could appreciate those, 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 that era, you know. Uh, but in those days, I guess from, you know, 15, 16, 17, 18, it was the disco era, you know, it, cars were the big thing, uh, you know. Hair and heels on girls. <laughs> cruising, driving around, cruising. It's about going out, meeting girls, probably getting into fights every weekend, you know, one, one neighborhood against another neighborhood. And uh, it was a good time. It was a great time to grow up in New York, you know? Yeah, and a fight a fight was a fight. There were no guns involved. No guns, it was just fights. Fights. And, you know, there were, I got to be honest, I wasn't into too many of those. I mean, I, you know, we had our little beefs here and there. But, but we used to go out. We used to have a good time. You know, we got a lot of aggression out at a young age, Tommy and I. Started in karate. You know, we were in the same martial arts school for a while. Then as time went on, I remember Tommy left first and went to boxing. I think it was on Avenue with Angelo Defenders. Yes. I stayed a little bit longer with Lou Neglia in the martial arts school until I got my license. Then, because he ran it too much like an academy, and I started getting interested in girls and going out to clubs. So I joined up the boxing gym with Tommy, and we continued on there for a while, too. And, Larry, you're a, you're a kickboxer, right? I did kickboxing, yes. I, and I was then a, a, an instructor for years. Is there, so is there a belt? Are you belted in I that? Got, I got a second-degree black belt in Florida, and it was given to me by two guys that are incredible fighters. Donnie Hare, who passed away. And this name that people will know, Don the Dragon Wilson. He's like an 11-time champion. Lou Neglia knows him well. Because I lost time, don't forget, in prison. While I was there, I continued to train. I trained with other boxers and martial artists. Right up, and I still do when I came home. first got out, I was doing a, a show at Neglia at the Capital of Canal yeah. Street. And I was working the corner for three different fighters. And you, you came with me. Yeah. That's right. And in the middle of the night, we went to see Neglia. We knocked on his door like 2 o'clock in the morning. Yeah. Let yeah. me ask you something, Larry. Did uh, being a martial artist uh, pay its dues in prison? Well, you, you know, even there, I, the only time I got in, in, a, in beefs, it was over the basketball because I was much – I was very good. And when you're a white guy in jail that good in basketball, you're challenged. So two or three times I did. and. I got the better of two out of the three. The third one was ended quick and it was probably neutral, but three beefs all on the basketball court. But yes, it certainly helped because I knew how to keep my distance and they couldn't hit me. And I was Is it there. also uh, reputation wise when someone knows you got those kind of skills yeah. they don't want to Yeah, well, I guess they did because I was doing classes even in there. We were doing uh -huh. cardio type classes and things like that. Uh but the key, like Tom will tell you, you gotta distance bridge keep out of their range and uh -huh. like, you know and a lot of people don't know that they want to get up in your face real quick and that's when they get you know hit that's hit, when they get hit they get hit quick so. yeah 
Exactly. I, you know, I just want to show the uh, the audience. Tommy Dades has a book called Friends of the Family, which uh, deals with the mafia cops, uh, Louis Ippolito and Stephen Caracappa, and that could be a movie in itself. And Larry Mazza has a book called uh, The Life, which describes his life uh, as a made guy in the Colombo crime family. So I think that most people that are tuning in, that's what they want to hear about. Yeah. Larry, so you um, you were 17 years old, I believe. You were working delivering groceries, right? Right. And something happened that changed your life. You want to tell us about that? Yeah. Tommy took a ride to Vegas. He left me <laughs> alone. Remember, it's about that time you left. It's funny. I, did. I left to Vegas at 16 for a year. Yeah, all right. You were gone. So no, Anyway, yeah, I was working in a grocery store, and I met uh, – it's funny when I say it now. I met an older woman. She was about 31. I was about 18. Actually wasn't quite 18, but I lied. I wanted her to think I was over 18. And uh, we, we wound up having an affair. The affair lasted almost 10 years. And along the way, I found out her husband was a big gangster. So I was a little paranoid for a while until she explained to me that she's going to talk to him about it and make it okay. Ultimately, that happened, and it's uh, Greg Scarpa, the Grim Reaper. Everybody knows him. And uh, I, Larry, when you found out that her husband was Greg Scarpa, I mean, didn't you? I mean, you had to be like nervous as all hell that you were going to get whacked. Well, I'm going to tell you the truth. At first, you know, I was naive. I mean, I knew a little bit about the gangster stuff from my uncle Albert. You know, later on, Tommy and I were in like certain clubs we knew they were wise guys like sammy's club sammy the bull but i didn't know greg by name i didn't know who he was she told me he's an influential guy he could help me you know and i originally started in a legitimate business with him but then as i started seeing different things happening where i would get accounts just because he would send somebody to talk to the person that told me no the day before and I, you know, and then learning more and then hearing from like my Uncle Albert and different people, I knew he was a vicious guy. And yeah, that's when I got paranoid. And I thought, absolutely, when he finds out, I'm done. So you knew him by the name The Grim Reaper, which obviously is a pretty yeah. scary name in itself, right? That, that came later on. That came way later on. Early on, he wasn't known as that. He, he really is one of the few guys that didn't have a nickname. He was Greg from 13th Avenue. But then as the years went on, he was Hannibal, he was the Grim Reaper, he was Freddy Krueger. I mean, he had all the names. And, Cap and uh, General Schwarzkopf during the war. <laughs> well, the peop the, a lot of the people listening, they don't know when you refer to the war, that was a war between two factions of the Colombo crime family, right? And you, Greg Scarpa, uh, I remember the, the passage in the book where he was at a meeting and he didn't commit. Because he knew that if he committed, one side or the other was going to have him killed. Yeah. So he, was, he didn't commit at that meeting. You yeah. That, talk about that? Yeah. He was actually uh, sent for by Jimmy Angelina, who was a consulier. And Tommy knows that for how many years he had that position. And uh, at that meeting, I walked in. And when they got together, when Jimmy came out, I was going to walk away because I had no right being in a meeting at that level. And Greg says, no, it, it, you stay. And he looked at Jimmy and says, is it okay if you stay? If he stays? And he said, of course, Larry can stay. So I heard I heard it firsthand that Vic is making a power move. He wants to take over the family. He asked me, meaning Jimmy, to talk to all the captains. And even though Greg wasn't an official captain at the time, he was a boss's man. So he was considered uh, a, a capo. And and that that's Vic Arena. And the other faction was the Persicos, right? Right. And okay. we were. We were aligned with the person that goes all along. So he, uh, Jimmy told him that this is happening. And if, if this happens, will you back Vic? He wants to know your position. So I remember him saying, I'm just out of the hospital. I, I'm really semi retired. Wherever the chips fall, I'll, I'll get in line. He was really fumbling through it. I never saw that. Well, when Cessna that first comes to him? Not no, it comes afterwards. That well, Greg, did he, he also was was he HIV positive at this time? He was. He was just out of the hospital. That's what I'm saying. He had like ten operations and two. Which months. was from, he got that from a blood transfusion. Holy yeah. Yes. Yep. 
So let me finish this part. Then we'll get, we can okay. get to all that. So now I get in the car with him. I'm driving back to the club. I'm around him long enough now and close enough that I can be, I can ask him. And I said, Greg, I said, why didn't you declare yourself? I knew something was wrong. And he said, even all that time in the hospital on the medication and weak as a, you know, an, an old, old man, he said, if I would have backed Vic Arena, Jimmy could go back to Junior and tell him I'm backing him in the move and Junior will clip me. If I tell him, no, I'm going to remain loyal to Junior, Vic knows he's got to get Greg out of the way. So either way, he gets killed. And that's, that's one of those unwritten Cosa Nostra rules, right? Well, it's it's not unwritten. You're not, not supposed to go against the boss. It's one of the top four or five rules you're told that night. You know, you don't go against the family ever. You don't talk to law ever. You don't mess with others' women ever. And we don't sell drugs. Every single one of them was broken every day. But that's another right. story. <laughs> well, you know, what's amazing is, and uh, Tommy and I were talking about the similarities between the mob and the police department. You know, <laughs> and we said in some ways, the mob always protects the bosses. And, you know, perfect example is when shit goes down and people are going to jail, they want to sacrifice, you know, the, the lower level soldiers so yeah. that the, the bosses can walk free. Well, the other thing I'd like to think is you guys, uh, you know, as you rise up, lead by example. With us, it turns into a do as I say, not as I do. Well, it goes with the police department, too. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, well. We, we, call, we called it white shirt immunity. Yeah, it did. You know, in every walk of life, I guess there's going to be that percentage of you know, guys that are no good, you know. But, uh, but, but yeah, you know, we and during the war, I mean, getting into that, Tommy and I crossed paths several times. And, you know, in, in comical ways and sometimes not so comical, more dangerous. Yeah, one way was almost a lethal way. <laughs> yeah, the one well, with... Well, Tommy, why don't you tell us about that when you crossed paths almost a lethal way? Well, what happened was uh, me and... Me and uh, I, was in the, the, I was still in the detective squad and uh, the war was in full, full, full steam ahead. And me and uh, my boss, Joe Parano, Sergeant Joe Parano, we were driving around, and we had gotten word from somebody that uh, this guy Bobby Zambardi was dealing in tag jobs on Lexuses. And we see this guy in Fusco had a club on 66th Street and 11th Avenue. Larry's there. Jimmy Del Mastro's there. I think Larry Fiorenza is there. Uh, this other guy, I won't mention his name because he's the one I'm going to lead to. Um, uh, Carmine Sessa was having a meeting inside. There was a big boss's meeting going inside. And me and the sergeant pulled over. We saw Alexis. And no, what we did was we saw the Alexis and we put it over the air. We put the plate over the air. And Central comes back and said, no hit on the plate. So we make a U-turn. And when we make a U-turn, we get out of the car. And Larry's got a box. Little do I know there's a shotgun in the box. And everybody puts their heads down and starts like walking backwards a little bit. And all of a sudden, this other guy standing there in a warm up suit pulls out a friggin' 38. I had my gun on my ankle. I grabbed the gun off my ankle. I chased this guy for two blocks. I can't take it. I, thug, I do a star seeing hutch on him. I dive off a car on top of him. <laughs> And I cuff him up. The gun was defaced and had hollow point rounds in it. I wasn't even wearing a vest. Oh, yeah, yeah. And of course, when we get back, everybody, you know, that was there is gone. I don't find out the real story until Larry tells me there was like eight of them and everybody had a pistol or a shotgun on them. And me and the sergeant are just looking at a tag job, you know? So, what was this, 1991? This is about 92, I'd say. 92. So, we, you know, we knew we were under surveillance a lot more than usual. We even had, don't forget, which we'll get to later, we had the uh, uh, the frequency to listen in to the task force and the FBI as they're following us. But that's another story. So this one, later on, I know you don't want to mention his name, so I won't either. I'll just call him Joe Brains the second. <laughs> he just tries to pull out the gun, but he tells us afterwards that he was sacrificing himself. Yeah, okay. Yeah. <laughs> he, was, he was sacrificing himself for us. I says, you know, I ain't going to get you a button. I can tell you that. You may get you killed. 
Larry, like, when all of this was happening, did you and Tommy talk? No, no. And I, you know, the closest we came was hearing when I heard him on the radio and I'd hear him saying something like, that's Jimmy and Larry. And, and then, and he didn't know at the time we were listening. I didn't know they had the frequency. Right, of course not. So, you know, we'd be following another guy. We'll call him Joe C from Wild Bill's crew. And we're chasing him. And then we hear Tommy and his partner. And I know Tommy's voice. I even said it in the book. He has a distinctive voice. And he says, there's Larry and Jimmy. So we take off because we know he's behind us and we're loaded up. This is another time. Jimmy lets me out of the car. Okay. Well, I tell him, Let, pull, get it a little distance. The only reason we got distance was Jimmy made a left and a car got between us. So he was able to really floor it on a one-way street. And Tommy had the light on now, but he couldn't get around that car. So we got to the corner. I jumped out with a box full of guns. I had my vest on. And Jimmy knows the streets pretty good from his uh, Brooklyn Union gas days. He ducked into like an alleyway he knew, saw the lights go by. I was hiding down steps. I saw the lights go by. And we had a rendezvous point where we would meet, excuse me, that's something like, about a half hour later, and I met up with him there with the guns. So there were times like that, but we really, we never spoke. Um, I can't say we did, and you know, and, and but I will say this, if we did, you know, afterwards, Tommy was always supportive and helpful, but, you know, never even came this close to crossing the line and telling me something he shouldn't, even earlier on, before the war. Well, you know, in actuality, uh, a cop can get jammed up just for associating with uh, yeah. a known felon, you know, and uh, well, that's where he's... Way before. I wasn't a felon. I was never arrested. It was early right. on, and he tried to talk me out of it when he came back from Vegas. Larry, let me just uh, backtrack a little bit. Mm -hmm. Your intention, your dad was a New York City fire lieutenant, yep. and your intention was to become a New York City fireman in fact, you were going to school at John Jay College of Criminal Justice, yeah. studying criminal justice, right? I studied that. I did fire science. I took psychology, English. All right. So you had no intention in no. entering a life of crime. No, I didn't. You wanted to be, and and the, the test was held up by some litigation, right? Which was very yeah. common back then. Yeah. What happened was the, the physical and the fire department test is very difficult. Uh, the written really wasn't that hard. But at the time, and not to get into any racial nonsense, there were uh, minorities that were complaining, so they had to redo the. Uh, they they brought it to court, and the women complained it was too hard, and the judge took two years to rule on it, and then when he ruled on it, he ruled that we had to take the test over again. That's a long four years when you're eighteen, nineteen, sure. you know, and you, it's easily you're gonna go in one direction. Uh, so, but no, I I, I was going to be a fireman. And my father always says it may rest in peace. I, I would have been a chief. He says, you could have rose in that, in you know, uh, just like you did in that other life. I would have been a chief. Or something. Oh, it was said in, in your book, it was said that you were a good student and you never studied. You just wasn't. That's why so. he didn't ask me to go to college. He says, I was smart. My mother and father said out of my, my brother and sister, I was the smartest, even though my brother's the most successful. He went to college and he applied himself. Uh, but me, I would have more like, like like that civil civil servant working type of thing, and uh, I would have been deaf. You know, I, I got great marks without applying myself. Right. You know, the what Greg Scarpa, his first job that he gave you was a le legitimate job, like checking fire extinguishers or something like that. And then that yeah. that business didn't work out; it went under. And then you got into the bookmaking business. Well, before and, that. Mm -hmm. And uh, that wasn't, you wound up losing a lot of money, right? Well, there were times learning because I, you know, I didn't go to school, the school of bookmaking. I didn't spend years doing it. Uh, I got into it. You know, I was really good with numbers and Greg saw that. So he brought me into the number business and I helped them expand that. And then he put me in the sports business and I helped them expand that. But when you win, the expansion is good. Everybody's got their hand out. When you lose, you're responsible. So it becomes right. uh, a treacherous backstabbing type of thing. And uh, you're only- And whether you, whether you were making money or losing money, he wanted his money. Oh, and the, on the Shylock money, yes. The interest, absolutely. 
So you, you were know, paying a vig to him yeah. every week and not even touching the principal, right? Right, right. All the way, even during the war. There was no break, no nothing from anybody. <laughs> yeah. There's, there's no honor among thieves? No, Is that I accurate? Remember them telling me and Jimmy, like we have a, a client, a, a customer on 11th Avenue, like a block from Wild Bill's. They're telling us, be careful, be careful. These guys are looking for you. But they would not care how careful we were to go collect the money two doors from Wild Bill. There we can go. You right. know, hypocrite. The most hypocritical life you'll ever see. But I want to go. You, when were you actually uh when were you actually made? What year? Just at the tail end of the war, uh after the Nikki Black hit. So it really wasn't the tail end of the war, it was about the middle of it. And it was in January or early February, we met at the Meadowlands Hotel. And there was a big meeting where we were going to name Joe T, the boss, the official boss of the personal faction, and name Jojo Russo the underboss. Now, tradition says that you can't be in a room like that, you can't be in a meeting, you can't sit at the table unless you're a made guy. So Teddy told brought a message to his brother through Carmine Sessa that all the men expect me and Jimmy to be there. We were being treated like the bosses, me, him, and, J and, and Greg, of course. So Teddy, uh, uh, Carmine Jr. sent a message back that those two guys recognized. He did it. Uh, it was a lackluster, very lackluster ceremony. We, uh, we couldn't prick the finger because of AIDS. We did burn something in our hands. It wasn't a saint. We did hold hands, the unbreakable chain. We would read all the rules or, uh, you know, Joe T recited them to us. Jojo said, had something to say. And, you know, while he was doing it, uh, it was funny because I was saying to myself, didn't Vic Arena hear these rules? And didn't Greg hear these rules? They're telling me stuff that they're all, uh, you know, they're all breaking. And, and I, I was really, so when I left the room, I, I and then told Jimmy to go in, who was insulted because I went in first. Uh, it was like there's something wrong with this whole picture, you know. Uh, and then plus they made Greg an official captain that same night because once we get made, we have to go under another captain. And Greg was not letting us go. So he finally took the stripes officially for that reason. And that's the night I got to use this term. You got straightened out. Straightened out. <laughs> made. Uh, sold my soul to the devil. There's a lot of ways you can put it. But you know what? In the life and for what was going on, it meant something. You know, somebody in one of the books said it was done because of uh, uh, heroism. I think that's a little crazy, you know. Uh, but again, it's, it's it was a life of its own. What was it like to walk around the neighborhood and people knew that you were a made guy? What was that like? I, the, the respect didn't change. I mean, I was respected just because of Greg. I, you know, it didn't change that much. It was a technicality. Now I was able to sit with them and talk to them and put my two cents in, which I was doing anyway. And I'm going to say this. I get the same respect today, if not more. And I'm going to tell you why I get a little bit more today, because I'm still the man I am. I like to think that's a, a good man, you know, just a man's man or whatever you want to call it. Uh, I still tip good. And... I don't have the other half of the people that don't like us and don't respect the Italian guys that went that way. There's a lot of people in my neighborhood that, you know, they, they were disgusted that I turned into a, a mob guy, you know, and that's understandable, you know. So the respect part, it, you know, we already earned it. And I and here's another thing I, I said. We walked in the room and nobody waved the magic wand and made me some mystical something better. I walked out the same guy I was that I walked in. I just was now technically uh, an official member of the family. How did, I, you, uh, how did your family feel about it? They didn't know till later on, way later on, that that came out in court transcripts. I didn't hear you from a good family. I'm good. Tommy? I didn't hear you. I said you came from a very good family. Yeah, yeah. So, I mean, I didn't tell. The, they didn't know everything that was going on. Uh, until really the whole length of it when I was in, in court and they had to walk in and listen to the prosecutors just making me the next Al Capone or something. You know, just one of them said I was the most vicious, deadliest member of the Scarpa crew. Tommy knows that's not true. I mean, I was 
to say. You had to do under the Grim Reaper. You can't show weakness, but uh, you know, I, that that's not the uh, description. What was the in as far as being an earner? What was the best area of organized crime for you as far as earning money? Bookmaking. Bookmaking. Uh, the gambling. Uh, the, the the Shylock business was a tougher business because you had to be. Uh, I'm using a, a bad word, but Greg said it to me. The reason I'm successful, meaning him, is because I'm a fucking scumbag. I hope that's okay to say it. I'm just trying to. Quote. Yeah. Okay. Uh, and he knows I wasn't. So I was never really overly successful in that. I had, you know, I gave guys breaks and things like that. And he would call me a sucker. So the sports business was a much cleaner business. Uh, and I did make the most money in that. I, I actually had a very big business for a young guy in the 20s, you know. And then I did have the downside, but the upside kept going up as the years went on. So, How about even uh, loan sharking? Did, were, you, were you involved in that? Yeah. Yeah, that's what I was saying. It's a little tougher because you can't, you got to be a tyrant. And and I wasn't. So I was always sort of juggling, giving guys a break. All right, if you owe me money this week, I'll see you next week. And uh, you, you can't do that to be a successful Shylock. So I never really considered myself a Shylock. I did have money on the street. I was collecting interest. But my big money, like Tommy said, was sports. Sports, yeah. Sports. You know, I, I want to just, uh, for one second, I want to... Uh... I have to do a, a short commercial, so we'll get right back, and we'll get back into the obvious. What people want to hear about is some of the hits you went on. <laughs> you know, do you mind talking about that? We could, we could. Okay, yeah, folks. If you're looking to move out of the New York City area because taxes are going through the roof, uh, you can relocate relocate to Myrtle Beach, South Carolina. Carol Waters of the Beach Realty Group has been buying and selling property in the Myrtle Beach area for 11 years now. Carol and her husband, Rob May, and a retired FDNY firefighter, also as NYPD, they work as a team. Carol's been a multi-million dollar producer for the past 10 years. They have great knowledge of all aspects of the real estate industry. Carol's well-known around the Irish community in New York. She worked in Fitzpatrick's Manhattan Hotel for over 20 years behind the stick. She was originally born in the Bronx and brought up in County Mayo, Ireland. Contact Carol Waters for all your real estate needs in the Myrtle Beach area. Ca Carol Waters, sell Myrtle Beach at gmail.com, 914-261-6681. She's waiting to hear from you guys. That's our only, that's our sponsor. <laughs> that's our loan sponsor. Can I, before, I, before we get into that, can I talk to Tommy a little bit about? Absolutely, I, absolutely. I was to hit when we would do our sparring. Oh, God. <laughs> I, no, I was fast. I feel like I threw a sword. Tommy, Tommy punched, hit like a mule. So I wasn't interested in getting black eyes and, and learning the hard way. So I would move and move and move and wear him out and just throw a few quick combos at him. <laughs> but happened? Tommy was also weighing two and a quarter, right? Yeah. Yeah, he was bigger than me. Yeah. No, yeah, I, he was. But what I was were you about a buck 85, was, buck 90? Those. It, it, I don't even think I was that high back then. But I don't think he was 225. Maybe. Yeah, no, I was about 225, 230 back then. Really? So then maybe I was 190. I, I'm forgetting. But I, I typically, when I was really into it, my, my my fighting weight was 175. But I know I was over that. So I was figuring maybe 185. But anyway, those hits. And Pete Rose, when I met him, he had my book. And he's called The Hit King. And he, had, and he signs autographs all day long at Mandalay Bay. So I went to meet him, and I showed him the book. And I'm calling him the hit king. I'm talking with kids about how great Pete Rose was. Finally, he gets an open. He, say, he says, I want to hear about your hits. <laughs> <laughs> That's what everybody wants to hear he about, you know? Regular guy. But you know what? I, I, I'll say this. You know, I, I've said it a few times, and, and Tommy knows this. You're brought along at a snail's pace. You are watched every step of the way. The first inkling I had of a hit was giving a guy a flat tire. He told me, give this guy a flat. You got to get there early in the morning, like six in the morning. So I'm thinking the guy parked in his spot or, or did something disrespectful. The next day, the newspaper, man killed fixing flat. So I read the paper. I knew I gave that guy a flat. 
So there's probably a little bit of culpability, if that's the word. But they, he watched. I didn't say, I didn't say boo to him. I didn't say ask what happened to him. I didn't tell him was that the car. I made it like it was nothing. Then time goes by, and he asks me, you know, drop him off somewhere. I drop him off. I find out a, a fellow named Bucky gets killed. That's all, the only name we got to use. Then I and less time and whatever. But then I come back. A few a month later, he says, "Do me a favor, lad. Go go buy a shovel." So you buy the shovel. I don't know what he's doing with it, but yes, I do. The next time, he tells me, "Buy a shovel. Go with my son Greg, and dig a hole in Wolf's Pond." So we go do that. Eventually, I sit there and I watch him shoot somebody, and it's a slow process. Ultimately, you get asked to do it. I was pretty lucky that I was always either a crash car driver or backup shooter on different things early on. But when the war started uh, is where I really, you know, he saw that whether it's capable or survival, whatever it was, uh, I became a, a, a serious shooter. Larry, describe when you just said uh, not everyone knew what you were talking about. You became a crash car driver. And usually when you guys went out on a hit, there were three cars, correct? Well, yeah, there could be two to three cars. Uh, typically, there's a car that's bringing the shooter, and he could also be the getaway car. So a guy jumps out, goes, shoots, gets back in that car. I was in the car behind them, blocking the street, and as they drive off, if a cop or an unmarked car or anybody looks like they're chasing, I got to crash into them to make sure those two guys get away. And it's funny, early on, that was part of how I got my nickname, Legitimate Larry. I was <laughs> one of the few guys with a legitimate I license. license. I had a license. So I was a perfect crash car guy. I could say, oh, I panicked. I heard gunshots. I saw, you know, I saw this guy, Tommy, whipping a turn, trying to chase somebody. <laughs> oh, so I got to crash into him. So, but it's all levels. And I remember the first one I, that where I was a crash car uh, with Joe Brewster was, uh, it was, Kid name it was either Albie or Patty on 86th Street. It was one of the two brothers that uh, had a beef with uh, one of uh, Persico's nephews. I don't want to bring his name up. He just got home. Hopefully, he stays out of trouble. But uh, they had a beef, so it was an open contract for this guy. And this is a crazy one because it's funny. I'm at, I'm at Greg's house, and Scappy comes in. It's me, Greg, and Linda. Scappy comes in and says that Nikki Black just spotted that kid that we're looking for on 86th Street. He says, but it's impossible to do it. You know, and Tommy knows 86th Street has cars lined up. Back then it was people hanging. It's like Saturday Night Fever. People dancing in the street. You know, every corner there's a hangout. I think there were cops on horses. I mean, it was like a real big, big present. So he calls Carmine. Greg Jr. and Bobby Zam. They come to the house, a quick plan, because the guy didn't go nowhere. He's hanging out, he's dancing on 86th Street. So we get to 86th Street, and I remember Joe Brewster getting on a payphone. I was parked right next to the pay. We didn't have cell phones at the time. And he calls Greg. He says, you know, it's really tough. There's cops all around, They're everywhere. Greg says, I'll be right there, <laughs> seeing you. So I'm watching. Not that far away. Within five minutes, maybe 10, he pulls up in the white rental car that his wife Linda was using. And I see him making a K-turn. So that was the move right there. He stopped traffic. So now the guys jump out, about 12 shots. They jump back in and go, and I followed right behind. So we get back to the house, and the first thing Greg asked Joe Brewster, how was Larry? Because that was one of the first times I was right, really right there. And I remember, and I was, you know, it's scary in hindsight how I, I found I was cool and collective under certain things. There's one other one I want to tell you. That sort of scared me a little bit in my own mind. That I just did this and I'm like, okay, I'm okay with it, you know? So we get to the house and Scappy, he as it went down, he kisses us all. Linda's proud. I was there because, you know, we were still together. And I remember they get a call 
from somebody. Now, Greg had, you know, uh, let's call it a crystal ball and leave it at that. Somebody called and said that that guy didn't die instantly. He got hit with like 12, well, maybe a couple missed, but, you know, they empty two six shooters or whatever it was, revolvers, maybe five. Anyway, he dies on the way in the ambulance. And Greg got pissed. He looked at me and Gregory and said he could have identified you on the way to the hospital. He says, next time, I don't care how many bullets you put in him, you put one behind his ear. And he's looking at me. That was my trademark. Yep, that's what he said. He says, that's my trademark. And he made sure he was this was fatherly advice he's giving me and Greg Jr., his son. Make sure you put one behind his ear. So, you know. That was, um, and then there was one during the war. This is really when you know you're not the same person. You're living in a, again, Tommy knows. I came from a life where this was not, shouldn't have been normal. It's where Greg says somebody on our own side is going to turn on us, okay? So it could be just the three of us, nobody else. He gets rid of everybody. All the other guys that were around. There was a guy named Joe, there was a guy named Larry, a guy named Danny, Dino, all these guys, they couldn't be around anymore. Just the three of us. The trust had to be there. So we go to a meeting in Staten Island with Dinah. Okay? We go into the diner, meeting our own friends. Finish the meeting. We walk it out to the car. Okay? As we, the second we get in the car, okay, Jimmy's behind the wheel, Greg's in the front seat, I'm in the back. Two rows of guys start walking on each side of us. There's like three guys on each side, and they've got something in their hand. True story. We didn't even go for our guns. Jimmy didn't try to start the car. We were resigned to die. We thought we fucked up. Again, excuse me. And we were resigned to die. We didn't even move. As they go by, they're carrying bowling bags. It's a bowling team that goes walking by. <laughs> so now we break out in this nervous laughter, but from that second on, we never let our guard down. Who watched the mirror? Who watched the mirror? This mirror. I was in the back always looking around, always had a gun out. But that night, I remember talking to Jimmy, and he said the same thing. He said, I'm more concerned right now that I was just going to sit there and take these bullets. And I said, you're right. I said, I feel the same way. I don't, I, that worries me more than that we could have got killed. The fact that I was resigned to die. All right. Well, could I just shout out to our live chat? Joe Murray, thank you so much for that $100 super chat. That's uh, hitting the jackpot. Princess Mitch, thanks for the nine ninety nine dollars super chat. Um, there's more. You guys are throwing money at me. Thank you. <laughs> Scotty Wagner wanted to know. Uh, he said, I'm positive I met him back in the day before I came on the job, a, a performer detective. Ryan Investigative Group, thank you for the $5 super chat. Oh, Scotty Wagner asked uh, Larry, uh, have you ever hung out at a club called Cadabras? Cadabra sounds familiar. Uh, with, uh, I hung out all of them. I mean, I was Cadabras. I was at the, uh, you know, Tally's Pastels, the uh, Fox, Electric Circus, Long Number. You know, you know, it sounds very familiar. I think that might have been in Long Island, or was it Third Avenue? Was it Jasmine's first? Was no, no, no. Uh, yeah, yeah. Well, you don't tell me you guys were Disco Dandies back then. I don't. <laughs> I don't doubt I was there. It uh, changes. Cadavers, yeah, it sounds very familiar. And then there was another one like in Canarsie City Scene. That City Scene. Change names. Oh. All the streets where Tommy Karate was. Channel 80, um, you know, Uncle Sam's, you name We were all the discos, everyone, even in the city, studio, uh, Xenon's, New York, New York. We, it was the heyday, disco. So Aaron Rodriguez, thank you for the twenty four ninety nine super chat. I got a shout out to these folks. Uh, who else? Who else? I got lots of – Steve Cologne, thank you for the nineteen ninety nine. This is I got these superstars on the show and everyone's throwing me money. I'm gonna have to take you guys out to dinner. Uh, 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 what's his name? Pat Russo, New York Cops and Kids Boxing, four ninety nine. Thank you so much, Duty Ron. Thank you so much. 
Let's what get about- back to Larry. I'd love to shout out to the whole chat group, but this, Larry's got better stories than me. About Rick Torelli. Yeah, no. Rick Torelli told me he was going out to dinner. Oh, you know, so Larry, I want, to, I want to ask you if you recognize this was a real, real dangerous mafia family from New York City. Do you recognize these guys? You know what? I, I thought that was going to be my last breath that night with that crew. <laughs> yeah. Well, there's three cops in that picture, and there's a, yeah. a TV producer, Kevin Kaufman. Yeah, yeah that was a perfect murder. I, and guess what I played? A corrupt What's that? ex-cop. I played a corrupt ex-cop. Is that right? Working for the mob. And it was uh, it was a true story out of Vegas, a true murder, mur- you know, true murder. And the, the corrupt cop's name was Joe Blasco, and he was working for Tony Spilatro, who was, that was Joe that Pesci was in Casino. Lefty Rosenthal. Yeah, but Joe Pe- yeah, he worked for Joe Pesci. And uh, and I just found out through my cousin, who's here from Vegas now, that he uh, he worked in a, a saloon called the Crazy Horse Saloon. It was a cabaret. Well, when I was behind the bar in the scene, I could have been a cabaret. Now, Kevin Calvin would have known that we could have had some broads on to set. With it. <laughs> you know, it's funny uh, what a small world it is. Uh, what's his name? Robert Bob Maladnich wrote yeah, the forward to your book. Yes, he and did. He's a, he's a friend of mine. Yeah, no, and you he know. was in the he was the, in the opening scene yeah. of The Irishman because he's Irish. like six foot eight, right? Yep, Bob, the big guy. Bobby used to be a boxer, and Bobby wrote a couple of articles on me in boxing. Yeah. He, he gave me the look in the movie. If you see, he glances at me, yeah. and then, then we come up the step. That was the signal to go shoot Albert Anastasia. Wow. But, but yeah, you, know, you know why I, I asked him to write the forward? Because he knew the story. At first, Tommy had hooked me up with him, and, and he and he was going to write it. But as he was reading what I wrote, I remember him telling me, you don't need me. Just polish it up. You really don't need me. So when I did finish it and had it proofread and everything, I asked him to write uh, a forward. Because I didn't want to describe myself. The forward, you typically say a little something about yourself. And I think it, it's a lot better coming from someone else. Because the guy, he did a great job. The guy in the cover of your book, and that's the Nikki Black homicide. Mm-hmm. And the guy with the hat on, that's Inspector John Lynch standing in looking at the body. Oh, is that right? And I was standing there when they took that picture. Oh, wow. See, what a crazy small world. And we probably walked down that street after Lewis Negley a few times to go to Joe's or go to Pizza Park. That was there. You were even on our way to, to, to Bath Beach Bodybuilding. That was right where we would walk by. We must have walked by that spot as friends. Times. Yep. And then you were there to clean up my mess. Amazing. I there to clean up your mess. <laughs> <laughs> oh, God. So, Larry, now you're still living this life. Uh, what was it like day to day living this life? Living that life? Yeah. Well, it's you know, there's a lot of stress between business and having to produce and looking over your shoulder, and that became more and more prevalent as I got more important to Greg. Uh, I was always with him. You know, I don't know if Tommy remembers this. There was a situation where Greg Jr. had a big beef with some Irish brothers over turf. And uh, there was a little mini war starting between us and these Irish guys. And I really had nothing to do with that business, the drug business. But I was still with Greg every single day. And if those guys would have made a move on him in the car, I'm sure they were going to say, Larry, get out while we shoot him. You know, so those pressures and, you know, anybody that had revenge on their mind. You know, because we, I remember Greg telling me he puts all his hits on record. So this way, when he wants to do a few off the record, they don't think he <laughs> it's him. You know, because we, we did a lot off the record. So that's, you know, open to revenge. So you did unsanctioned hits or hits that were yeah. just uh, someone messing with your business or someone... Messing yeah. with Greg or whatever. Yeah, there were a few of those for sure. Yeah, there was times where guys were, we were asked to let it go. So we did for two years, uh, but we caught up one way or the other. Uh, so, you know, and again, being with him all the time, that brings that little edge. You got to always keep be on your toes. Uh, 
But basically, as the, the, the split happened, which is relatively halfway through my tenure, you know, because a lot of people don't realize the tension started in like 87. It wasn't that the shooting started, but there were things going on, like they weren't straightening guys out in Brooklyn. A couple of bodies turned up that nobody really got the true reason why. And Greg seemed to know why or give me the reason why. Uh, and it was guys that Vic thought he had to get out of the way, all the way up to Jimmy Angelina. So, I mean, the war was nice. Tom Light says and Wild Bill. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. That's Bill Cutolo, right? Yep. Yeah, Bill, Bill Cutolo and, and Tom Light says and killed Jimmy Angelina. Yep. Yeah. And well, then, you know, you I said something. Of, very important. Just let me say something. I mean, a console year getting killed is unheard of. I mean, that is the almost the most untouchable. Actually, they're, they, they're like. They're supposed to save lives and make peace and keep some brains. That's, that's Tom That's Tom Hagen from The Godfather. Tom you don't kill him, right? That, that's why t Jimmy Angelina was a very good console. Yeah, Carmine Tessa had no right being there. And I've said that. Anybody that came out of Greg's crew is a good fellow material, captain material. You can't put them up on that administrative level. Is They'd be just like gas pipe and all these. I try to tell them, like, you you were separate from the Wimp. The, the, there was a, a group called the Wimpy Boys. Right. Larry, the Wimpy Boys was really run. They all answered to Greg. Right. And Greg Jr. really supervised what went on with the Wimpy Boys, but right. even though Larry was so close to Greg, Larry and Jimmy were very close to Greg, they really weren't a part of the Wimpy Boys. The Wimpy Boys is a whole other story in itself, and it's a whole other crew. And Larry and Jimmy really were not, I mean, they knew each other, they hung out in the club together, but used to, which is kind of a separate entity of Greg's. Right. The Wimpy Boys were a whole different, organization really and and you know who made that happen was uh linda big linda when he wanted to put me with greg jr earlier on because of my age you know i was more in line with those guys she wouldn't stand for it she said no he stays direct with you she was really concerned with my welfare and wanted to see me do well so i was a mini boss's man early on i went direct to him yeah larry you said before that um Greg couldn't forget about certain things. And I want to bring you to the incident where his daughter came home and said some limo driver tried to rape her. And uh, I believe you guys went out and gave him the beating of his life. Yes, we did. And to Greg, that wasn't good enough. Well, it, right after it was done and we were driving back, it seemed like it was enough. And I remember telling, not telling Greg, but my opinion was that, you know what? This guy got a serious beat and he learned his lesson and maybe he'll tell other people, you know, other people will know. Sometimes you want a guy to, to be able to talk about why it happened, you know. Uh, now, if he had gone the distance, I mean, any one of our sisters or wives or mothers, we'd want to do the same thing. So I could understand him wanting to kill the guy. But somewhere along the way, I think somebody – maybe Big Linda, maybe, but whatever it was, kept on it, kept on it, and won't let it go. And I think it got into him where he thought his pride, that he didn't kill this guy. He had to get him. So, yeah, we, we spent – the guy spent about six weeks in a the hospital. Then when he got out, he didn't work for another couple of months, whatever it was. So this took about four or five months, and we just kept calling the car service, calling the car service. Finally, he shows up. And, again, I was in one of the cars. Greg Jr. was – going right in the car with him. And that was significant because Scappy insisted that Gregory and I are not on it because it was too personal. You know, let other, so nobody loses control. And, you know, he was right because the first shot this guy got out, he picked his arm up and started running towards 13th Avenue. And he runs in front of a bus. The bus stops and Gregory chased him down and he shot him right in the middle of 13th Avenue. There's people all around. We had a maneuver to get out to pick him up. So it was a big scene. It didn't work out well. But we got back, and uh, when we uh, told Greg heard the story firsthand, he was beaming. He was proud. He was happy. Uh, but then when he heard again how it got a little out of hand, he asked me to go back. You know, I put on a baseball hat and sunglasses, just blend into the crowd. And as usual, back in that day, 
detectives were canvassing and nobody saw nothing. Nobody saw nothing. <laughs> You know, no, no one in Brooklyn he sees anything. What is that? Driver says, nah, I didn't recognize. I didn't know nothing. So, <laughs> you know, but, uh, but yeah. You know, Larry, you know, it's funny what you said because I, I was a, a homicide uh, boss in Manhattan North. And one of the things I used to do when, when we had a murder is I would take pictures of the crowd. Mm. Just see who was there, you know. Yeah, so you know, later on, when I we grabbed people off the street and they said, I wasn't out there, and go, you know, you could ID them. This is so and so, this is so and so. Also, they say, I watch enough of these shows now, you return to the scene of the crime a lot of times. That's not smart. And Tommy wants to say something, then I'm gonna tell you something about Nikki. Go ahead, Tom. Well, no, because what you're saying is when they killed Mikey the Bat Pallies, um, Joe Parano, my old boss, he had to be a major case at the time. And he was smart. He there's a crowd outside of uh, Tally's bar when they find the body. They made it look like a robbery. Right. But it wasn't a robbery. And Mikey the Bat's laying right near the jukebox that I used to play. It was crazy. Wow. Like the bot, the crime scene photos. I see a jukebox I used to play in. It was the same box. Unbelievable. And, uh, Joe Parano took a a videotape of the whole crowd. And I'm not going to mention his name, but yeah. I'm not convicted of it. But he's yeah. standing right at the front of the police barriers, got him on videotape, watching yeah. what was going on. And he had just killed him like five hours before. It's crazy. So let me tell you what happens on Nikki. After that went down, we had to be home at Jimmy's house to babysit his daughter. So we just finished and we shoot to the house. Uh, Jimmy pours us each a little bit of a drink and we're sipping the drink, playing with the baby, watching Seinfeld. And after about an hour, the wife gets back. So we jump in another car and we head back to the scene, but we're in a different car and I'm just driving by. I'm just curious, just the onlookers and everything like that. And I'll never forget and I tried to explain this in the book a little bit. When I pulled up, now it was like getting dark and the and the, the lights from the street lights were hitting down. And there's a bunch of kids hanging out on the corner, teenagers. And I pull up, I open my window, and I look at them and I say, hey, what's going on over here? And they say, oh, my God, there's a big mafia war going on. They just got Nikki <laughs> Black. And I'm saying, you don't say. No kidding. <laughs> and then... I shut my window, and as I shut the window, I got a little mirror effect, and just for that split second, I'm looking at myself, and I'm saying, yeah, there's a mafia war going on, right? And I'm like, you know, almost number two target. That's what he just did. I think he elevated me to the, to, he was going to kill me. You know, he's told my Uncle Albie not too much, you know, a day or two earlier. So I just all hit me. It all hit me when I looked in the mirror at myself. It was like, you know, you have those moments you never forget, you know, and it was very surreal and... Uh, what, was it, what was it like knowing that someone wanted to kill you? Well, the blatant uh, threat to my uncle, who's my mother's brother, made it very personal and, uh, you know, it's, it's hard to use certain words, but, you know, in the circumstances, that's probably the only one that, God forgive me, I don't regret 100%. Uh, and You're uh, talking Nikki Black. Yeah, Nikki Black. You know, yeah. because he would, he would have done it. And his idea was if he could break up the three of her, get me and Jimmy to come over to their side, you know, Greg's in no man's land. You know, because we were his tr most trusted by far. And loyal, Larry. Do you mind if I read the paragraph from the book that no, describes what no. happened? Yeah, you, no, please. All right. I leaned out the window and pointed the barrel at the back of Black's Mister Clean style head. I was no more than six inches from him as I blasted away. If Greg fired, his shot was muffled by mine, but it made no difference anyway. The powerful shotgun blast entered Black's head just behind his left ear. The pellets burst through this head before exiting out through his face. The force of the weapon blew his nose completely off. I saw it go flying into the windshield along with a good portion of his brain. 
The blood splattered all over the dashboard. Later, the cops told me they found his teeth across the street. That's pretty damn graphic, huh? It is. It is, you know. And uh, my mother asked me why I had to be so graphic. <laughs> you know, I, I, she read the book. I made my family read it uh, for several reasons, for several reasons. And, you know, one of them was actually proofreading because they were all intelligent. They all went to school. and uh, But I wanted an honest opinion. And she thought I should have toned that down a little bit. And this is a little bit more comical. Uh, the, uh, the Some of the sex scenes, she would have liked me to tone down. But she's <laughs> the only one that said that. So coming from a mom, you can understand it. I asked my editor, the person who finally helped me make sure everything was perfect. I told her about that. And she said, I'm going to say another dirty word. I hope it's a rated R community. <laughs> it there. is. Okay. Now, this is, she's not a young lady to set it to. She's retired from the USA Today uh, newspaper. And she looks at me and she says, your, your mother's worried about a blowjob when you're blowing guys' heads off with a shotgun? <laughs> you, know, so, you know, it's a totally different perspective. And this is what you're going to see in a movie. Hopefully we get a TV series or a movie. That's what it's going to look like. You know, you see some of these movies now. They got to show the whole chainsaw going through the arm. They don't leave anything to the imagination anymore. You know, Greg, I, I'm definitely not squeamish or anything. I've been to probably, you know, hundreds of homicide scenes. Listen, I but I got to ask you a question. I and I, I always say yeah. this about most cops that have seen what I've seen. Mm -hmm. And may, Tommy may agree with me or may not agree with me. Do you have, I would say most cops have PTSD, a level of it. Because of all the crazy shit we've seen. You know, all, all that about it. Especially yeah. when people get killed. You know, if, you, if you've been if you had standing next to another cop, watching another cop and justifiably kill somebody right in front of you and you're cuffing the guy, of course you, it's going to eventually, you know. So is, is that post-traumatic? Post -traumatic? Yeah, post-traumatic stress uh, yeah. syndrome. Yeah. yeah, I've had that and I've had some really bad dreams. Sometimes I wake up in the middle of the night with really, I mean, nightmares. And, uh, you know, so it's in there. It's in, it's in the recesses. It's always there. So these images can come back into yeah. your heads yeah. at yeah. some times. Yeah. I mean, they do for us, too, Absolutely. but in a different way. That you know? one does a lot. And, you know, that's why I says, God, forgive me, because I probably should be more remorseful as I am about a lot of things I did in my life. But that one, it was truly kill or be killed. and. You know, if I was in the army, I probably would have been a good sharpshooter. I would have became that guy that sits up in the rocks and just takes people out, and that would be okay, you know, for the ethical reasons. But that war was the stupidest thing that could have ever happened. It was the size of the Colombo crime family, mm -hmm. and they gained nothing out of it. And the stupidest thing that happened afterwards, the, to me, the last murder of that war was Alley Boy killing Wild Bill. Which was this? Which I think he was an idiot. He gave up his life. It's like he left popcorn to lead him right to lock him up. That's I, I thought he was almost pulling a ruse because that's how easy it was to identify exactly who was responsible for his death. It took a while to lock him up, but we did. Mm -hmm. But that that was the stupidest thing he could have done was kill Wild yeah. Bill. Well, you know he, he he got out a few times and never distanced himself. And I say that even kids today, there's guys that they're doing life on a consignment plan because they just keep on going back eight years, come back seven and he years. Did. He did his eight years. Exactly. Years. So you're still going to have what's yours. Just move away. Get out of the place. He was, the, they have more money than God. The person <laughs> have more money than, they couldn't fit a dollar bill in the attic. They've right. got more money than God. And I don't know where the hell it is, but they yeah. do have more money than God. And Ali Boy got out of jail for the second time. He beat the second case. Mm -hmm. And he had no reason to stick around. He still had the juice. He could have moved anywhere he wanted to go. Mm -hmm. But he wanted to stay in Brooklyn, be a boss. And he kills Billy five years later for really nothing. No. That but was his downfall. And now he's going to spend the rest of his life in rotten jail. Yeah. Well, I remember Greg telling me there's three guys that could never get a pass. 
Never. This was what he Miller told me. Miller was never getting a pass. He said, Vic obviously could never get a pass. Uh, Vinny Alloy could never get a pass. And Wild Bill. And Wild Bill, because they did, they went against the family a couple of times before. Okay. And, you know, guys like Joe Scopo, he was taking orders. He said he could have, he could have got through it. Joe Waverly taking orders. A lot of guys. And he also, well, he, Joe Waverly was an animal, though. Yeah. Yeah. He also said that if we lost the war, which he says we could never give in because we would be the sacrificial lambs. He's going to go for sure, and he says they're going to take us with him. He said there's going to have to be sacrificial lambs, and maybe Billy was that at the end to make everybody come in. Oh, Ali Boy got pinched for that gun in yeah. Florida. He was going to do 17, 16 months on the gun charge. Yeah. And he made us like – a remark like, I guess I'll be the boss while you're gone. And as Billy walked away, he tells somebody he's with, he's gone. He's gone. He's your underboss. Two days later, those people get called to the Bell Parkway and told them, you'll never see Billy again. And yeah. it was for nothing. It was the stupidest thing you could do because Billy stopped using, he, Billy tr started to trust Allie. Ali was put was was rocking him to sleep, and he didn't have a driver no more, no more bodyguards. He was sending him breads, popcorn machines for Christmas, and he just lured, lured him right in to relax and let his guard down. Yeah, and I remember locking Billy up, and I swear I knew something was going to happen to him. And I asked him. I said, Billy, listen, you don't got to respond to me. I had a mutual respect with him, and I happened to have liked him. I happened to have liked Billy a lot. And I said, well, I know you got a lot of money. You just beat the case of your life, so there's not, everything's starting from scratch. Why don't you just take your family and take the money and move to California? Who's going to look for you? Right. You know, hey, I wish I could, but I can't. Yeah. A year later, he was dead. Yeah. Well, here's a here's a little chilling story that it didn't happen, but you know I go to back to a TV series or a movie if it happens. I there was some of the plans we had, conspiracies, plans, whatever for hits and stuff, are really Hollywood in nature, you know, because Greg had some mind. He wanted us. Uh, now I couldn't do it, but Billy didn't know Jimmy, and he didn't know a few other guys. He wanted to dress as FBI agents, okay? And I said, Billy's not going to come out. He says, not. Nah. The FBI goes, Billy will come out. He'll come out. And I think he said like a gentleman. He'll come out. I says, yeah, but he, he we got to show a badge. We got to, you know, show some credentials. He looks at me, Greg, and he says, I could get them. We'll leave it at that. He told me I could get them. So my point is, imagine two guys going up. Cuffing Billy, walking him out to the car, sliding him in the back seat. And who's in the back seat? The Grim Reaper. And this was a plan. You know, the other one was dressing up as Hasidic Jews. <laughs> that was another one. Uh, then Greg was going to have me wheel him in as a nurse. I was dressed as a male nurse, of course. <laughs> Needless to say. Uh, <laughs> and, and I'm going to wheel him in. And he... You know, with these meetings where everybody swore, nobody will shoot. It's a meeting for peace. We're going to, he yeah. said, forget about all this. They're not, we're never putting this together. We got to take them all out. So he wanted to go in. He was going to have his machine gun. I'm going to wheel him in like a little old man. He's going to take the blanket off like Al Pacino and Scarface, get up and start blasting them. Why don't you tell the story about what happened when you just went to Billy's club? Oh God, that was, that was, yeah, that's almost, it's hard for me to tell that because it's like people are going to think I'm embellishing and I'm not, and I'm not. What happened was there was some little, it was the cold war. I called it the cold war. There were little beefs going on over monies and business. So we had just, uh, a number runner just died, a number guy of ours. And we demanded that the guy come to us. Billy tells him, if you don't bring me the numbers, you're going to wind up in an oil drum. The guy came back to Greg's house crying. 
He's dead now. I don't know if you remember that big guy, Chuck, that was with Joe, Joe Sapp. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, he, he's gone now. But big teddy bear. He comes in the house. He's crying. That Billy's going to put me in an oil can. Greg just starts laughing. He says, you bring the numbers here. I'll take care of Billy. So somehow or another, I think it got back to Billy that we were coming to see him on his big Thursday night. So we're at my pool room. And we have three cars, like seven guys. We drive there. I'm the first car. And I'm in with a guy I'll call Joe. And uh, the middle car is Jimmy and Greg. And the back car has three or four of our heavyweights. With, and we all have guns. Just pistols. So as we drive up, I remember making the turn. If there wasn't 100 guys on this corner, there wasn't one. All right? They were behind Billy's car. You've seen a big, maybe an AK, just a big gun. Point. On the roof. They were on the roofs. They were on the roof across the street on top of the club. So I, I don't see all of that yet, but I see the guy with the machine gun, and I see all these guys. And I remember saying to myself, should I just drive, go? But I said, if I do that, Greg is going to rip me a new one in front of everybody. Now, again, this is my pride and my ego. I'm not going to have him telling me I was weak. So I pull right in Billy's driveway, and I remember the guy I'm calling, Joe, said I should have went. Oh, why don't you just go? So we get out. We jump out of the car, and this guy, uh, we'll, we'll, we'll call him Chicken Man, comes running over to the car because I think he's out or he's getting out. And I call oh, him. It's uh, 2025. All right. Well, I don't want to, you know, hopefully he, he, he goes straight. So he comes running, oh, at, <laughs> running at me with a gun. And uh, I, I, he said, put your hands on the car. Put your hands on the car. I looked at him. I said, am I under arrest? So he laughed. Everybody calmed down a little bit. I said, Greg is here to see Billy. That's all. He's just going to talk to him. So he gets out. They escort him in. And he's in there for two hours. And we're all standing there. The guys are coming to me like, what should we do if we hear a gunshot? So I told him, well, let's all spread out first of all. So we spread out. And I told uh, Dino, one of our guys, who had the he was he was uh, an ex cop, so he was, had the best gun, like a sixteen Glock or whatever it is. And we all had these little revolvers. I said, "You just shoot at the guy with the machine gun, and then everybody just scatter. I, we can't win." I says, "If that happens, just be ready to run." <laughs> you know, me and Jimmy had a driveway to run through, and uh, uh, after two hours, he comes walking out arm in arm with Joe Scopo. And that's when they thought we were on their side. And Joe Scopo was on Billy's side. Yeah. Yes. yeah. Right. And Joe Scopo was the underboss. Yeah. The arena faction. Right. So, you know, that was a that was a real tense night. Now, here's the funny thing. A couple of days later, another number situation comes up, and it's with Fat Sal, Michelta. He demands the numbers. And Greg says, that guy was with Joe Sapp for 100 years. Those are our numbers. So Fat Sal says, I'm coming to the candy store to see you tomorrow. So we get there first. There's four of us. There's me, Jimmy, Greg, and one other guy. I think it was Richie. And I see the big white Lincoln coming. I'm standing in front. And as he pulls up, I open the door. I see Greg. Sal's pulling up. Greg comes walking out the door. He's going to talk to him in front of the place. Soon as Sal saw him, he took off. He didn't want no part of it. So we were winning the little Cold War. I, and I got to go step back. That's the night where they knew Greg was no longer in the middle. I made a mistake there. That night when we left, they knew for a fact we were on the other side now. Because Greg made a speech that you guys were you sit in the bar where Carmine Tessa sits Bobby Zam, I think Jerry... And one other person where they're sitting on, on Vic, Vic catches the move. Yeah. And yeah. Carmine comes crying back to Greg. He missed. After wow. missed yeah. After they missed that attempt, uh, he comes to Greg's house because now he's panicking. Vic is declaring that they tried to kill him. They're rebels. And they all go into hiding for a few days. And he comes to see Greg. And now he says that he wanted me to poll the captains. And he says, you're going to wind up just like just like uh, Jimmy. You can't do that. you know." So he got literally got on his hands and knees and begged Greg to be on his side. And I didn't like it because 
Carmine left us. He didn't support us when he was out on Long Island with Vicarina. Uh, I got proposed four years earlier when, you know, and when when uh, Carmine became a captain and then comes to Yale later on, and nothing ever happened. Not only me, uh, there's another guy, the one I called Joe and Jimmy. We were on the list for, for you know, four years. They weren't making anybody from Brooklyn, only Long Island. So now he comes running back, and I used I used a term he taught me, Greg. I said, he's waving two flags. I said, you always tell me I can't do that. He says, nah, Carmine's coming back where he belongs. He's, he's you know, he grew up under him. Hey, so he, well, Carmine was one of the original Wimpy boys. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. To be with Greg and then branched off. Right. Yeah. No, when he got made, they had to put him under somebody else. And Vic was a captain at the time. They put him with Vic Arena. Just like when Joe Sapp got made, they put him with Wild Bill, who was a captain. When uh, Gregory got made, they put him with Scappy. And then when Scappy dies, Gregory. Well, well, Gregory became uh, the acting when Scappy went away. And then, yeah, then official. Then he becomes official. Yeah. yeah. So there was a lot of jockey and a lot of things that would happen. That's why a lot of people don't know that. They just think it happened real quick. But it was brewing. And, uh, yeah, it's a, it's a nightmare we don't need to live through again, ever. You know, Larry, you mentioned in, in the book a lot about, um, you know, we always hear the term stand-up guy. Mm -hmm. And really, there's not a lot of stand-up guys. Uh, when people are put in bad situations, they're going to do what's best for them. No, that's exactly right. That's a perfect way to put it. And a stand-up guy can be, you know, that's a, a term that can be used in a lot of different ways. A stand-up guy could be a guy that won't back down from a beef. A stand-up guy can be a guy that, you know, is, is uh, good, honest in business and you can trust him and he pays you and you pay him. And a stand-up guy is a guy that doesn't talk to the law. You know, it's just like ratting comes in a lot of different ways. You don't, you know, the, taking the stand is obviously the worst one. But how about when the boss and his son know there's an informant under them for 20 years and they let him live? How about when your boss is an informant. How about when guys cop out and admit who they are, what they are, what they did. And on our case in particular, the first group of guys came in, there were still big arguments going on as to whether this is a RICO case, because first they had to prove there was a family. Once those five guys came in in front of the judge and said, yes, we're part of the Colombo family. We're part of the war, part of the personal faction. You already, you already broke the rules. By yeah. So I'm saying, you know, they're, okay, they're half rats. or well, they're a little bit of a rat. You know? <laughs> but if you know a guy under you is a rat and you'll, but my, my thing is this, it's not only the money. They had enough money, but he was a big earner. So they turned the other cheek. For that's one reason. Here's what I think. I think they knew if he killed and sent the wrong message up to his handler, whoever it was, wherever they are, that it would deflect away from where it really came from. And I know, I know hits that we did, others got blamed for. So, you know, they you it's a using life. You know, and even Junior, when he took the stand as his own attorney, or he became his own attorney, and he admitted he's a good fella, he was saying, I didn't say it. My lawyer said it. <laughs> you know, <laughs> acting the problem, you know, like John Gotti, yeah. like guys who get off with the take plea, say, 10 years. Yeah. And he would refuse guys to say, to allocute in, in court yeah. because basically yeah. you're admitting to your crimes. Right. But he would make you go to trial and instead of getting 10 years, they yeah. get life. Right. Yeah. And then. How about, you know, uh, his flamboyant ways? I'm not saying that's a rat. It's stupid. You know, so sometimes you're just stupid makes you a rat. His big mouth on tapes didn't help. And he didn't learn from his friend Andrew. What would they call quack quack? Quack quack. <laughs> John Gotti once said, you could dial any seven numbers. And he'll and you the chance, you'll catch Andrew on the phone talking about drugs. What's <laughs> up Dial any seven numbers, you know. So that's but, a big reason why Castellano got killed too. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, because you know the, the, the but again, you know, 
even though they were breaking a rule selling drugs. Then they break a, will, a rule and kill a boss who's, and it wasn't sanctioned, obviously. The commission didn't allow that. So, you know, going back to the stand-up guy, I think I'm a stand-up guy, even now. If I'm with Tommy and we're having something going on, he can rely on me. And if we do something together, I'm not going to go snitch on him. And I know he's not going to do that to me. Uh, you know, but you also dealt the hand. And when I'm sitting there and I find out, I'm going to tell you one more thing that really turned me over. You know, you hear all these things while you're away. And then they start coming at me saying I had to know about it. You know, now I'm wondering, what are they thinking here? They thinking I'm a rat too? But my partner, Jimmy, was on the lamp while I was in for about 10 months. And we had in our Shylock business about 3,500 each coming. When we went away, we left 2,000 for guys to collect for us and give us 2,500 each, our families. So for the first two or three months, it was happening. Now I'm in jail. Jimmy's on the lam. Another two or three months goes by. We're getting 1250 each. Another three months goes by. It's about a month. You know, Jimmy gets like 500 each. Okay. The last month, when all this shit started coming out with Greg and different things, and more guys were flipping, you know, just it was, we started clogging the system. That's what the prosecutor said. So many Colombo guys were trying to get in and some didn't make it. They left Jimmy $135 and 135 for me. Now it was registered. It should have registered sooner. They want Jimmy to come back and get pinched so they could keep the business or they want him to come back and get killed. Because he's going to go after his money and maybe he runs into Billy or, or, or the chicken man or Scopo. So to me, those were the biggest rats on earth that you wanted this guy on the lamb. I'm ready to do life. I was, I was negotiating for like a 20 year play. He's on the lamb. Who knows how what's going to become of him? And they were going to force him to come back. That was to me. I, you know, I'm flipping one more card and it's the ace of spades and I'm done. Well, Stop. you know, Larry, like retrospectively, for for all that you did, uh, and I know it's not easy to do any time in prison, but doing 10 years was actually a pretty damn good deal. Well, yeah, in, in, um, in, in the grand scheme of things. It was a good deal. It was a good deal if he didn't cooperate. But cooperating 10 years was pretty hard. Yeah, but here's the thing with that. When I first started talking to them, it's because of what had come out. And I had really nothing to offer. They told me that. So they wanted me to have Jimmy come in or and to tell them what I knew about the corruption. And I won't get too deep into that, but I had a lot of info, and Tommy knows that. So it opened that can of worms, and it opened that door. And I walked out three times on them because Jimmy had to be part of whatever I did. Finally, it was getting really out there about Greg and he had somebody in his pocket and whatever. And now they really needed to know, as Tommy knows, whatever I knew. And there was a lot. There was the scanner. Uh, there was, uh, uh, you know, a phone that I had that still to this day mysteriously disappeared. You know, one of those big shoe phones, sure. you know. You know, I yeah, I don't want to go off into that direction, but Larry, yeah. could you stop for one second? Yeah, of course. I, I this this story is so unbelievable, and it has so many different parts to it. Mm -hmm. Would you guys come back another time? Of course, I I'm, would love because we yeah. we didn't even touch the court case. We didn't touch any of the other <laughs> stuff that's going on, and it's fascinating. But yeah. we're already we're I, already at an hour and twenty minutes. Yeah, and, I uh, that already about. Yeah. You know, I want to talk a little bit more about the good stuff. You know, Tommy and I, you know, a little bit of outside that life, even now, how we got back together. And like I said, you know, we got each other's back a thousand percent. You know, I would, I would love to hear all of that. I mean, I think people are fascinated by this. And of course, they're fascinated by the life. Tommy Dades, I mean, yeah. you had a, an amazing police career, too. And people want to hear more about that, too, and how it intertwined, how your lives intertwined with each other and how to this day. 
you're still friends. That's pretty amazing, right? It is amazing. So they did it together. Yep, yep. Yes. And uh, you know something, Larry, one other thing. People yeah. want to know, how can they get your book? Someone just said there's not many available. Well, they, they are. But uh, every time I do a podcast, I sell out, which is a great thing. And I'm not saying that like a wise guy, like a wise guy, like egotistically. Uh, I just, it, it's a great thing and I'm blessed and I'm humbled by it. But it, I only had, I published it myself. I don't have a big publisher. I have a, a local printer and it's www. Larry Mazza dash the life dot com. So it's www dot Larry Mazza dash the life dot com. Great job on the book, and the book is really a great book to read. Everything from yeah. By the way, Larry, thank you so much for sending me a uh, signed copy. I open, showed him the signature. I sign every book that goes out. And the problem I'm having right now is my printer is getting. I don't know if you can see it. Can you see it? Yeah, there it is. Just let's get a little higher. Oh, okay. Yeah, there you go. So they can see I signed it for you. I wrote a nice little note. And he's getting old. He's a little sick. And he, I, so I may, I'm, I'm looking for somebody to maybe make, uh, you know, more of the time for me. That's great. I mean, I I thought the book was great. I, I couldn't put it down. That's uh, amazing. Yeah, I, I, thought, I mean, it was, it was so interesting. And I don't want to leave Tommy Dades uh, out there either because oh, he's, got his, he's got his own book. I read uh, it. Let me show it here. Oh, it's played out. There it is. It's it's an incredible story. It's just an incredible story. And Tommy Dade spearheaded the whole investigation. So you get it from the what the horse's mouth. You know, it's funny yeah. how a lot of these things intertwine. Like some of the same players involved in your thing are involved in his thing. It's amazing. Know? It's amazing. And that, do me a favor. Next time when you give me the time, tell me 10 minutes earlier. Oh, all right. I, was, I just said, Tommy, give him a call. Did I go on? It's eight o'clock. I'm sitting there waiting at eight. You know, <laughs> that was the only thing that made it airy. But uh, and I said, yeah, I, I got to show a couple more pictures. Oh, nice! The wife and my son Kelly. And your son's Kelly's a fireman, Kelly. right? Kelly's my manager now. No, he's an actor, believe it or not. No kidding. And he was on Broadway until the pandemic hit. Wow. So he's now just he's training in in a in a gym. Uh, I'm trying to get him back to run my gym. That's great. And there we go. That's my picture the day I met De Niro. Oh, that's one of my uh, Kelly's favorite pictures. So I don't know how you found that one, but that's a good uh, one. And who's this, who's this handsome guy? Tommy. Tommy D. He uh, needs to get straightened out. <laughs> yeah. Well, that's, that's why I was going to wear a suit and sunglasses because I didn't want to. And there he is with the uh, former chief uh, of detectives, uh, Bill Ali. Tommy. 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 I had a I had this girl that 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 follows you. And that was us at the Atlant in Atlantic City at the oh, Star Restaurant and the Golden Nugget. Oh, nice! Look at that. I got to tell you, I had this girl that follows us on Facebook, you and me, and our stories. And she wrote to me, "He's so handsome." Normally, I get that, but Tom, you 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 deserve it too, Tom. Don't get me. <laughs> hey, I saw that picture of you and Armand Desante. Wait a minute, but I told him, I says, uh, "You wanted me to hook you up with him." Because I know you were single again, and she says, "I would love it, but I like girls." So <laughs> we'll have to bring her into the movie. You're gonna have to have some alternative stuff nowadays. So we'll have hey, to. Hey, Larry, that was a good picture in your book with Armand Desante. Well, Armand Desante is uh, an off the charts, wonderful guy, gracious, helpful. Will do anything for you. He wants to be in all these movies, but I'll never forget. He told me he says, "I have, I don't have any better chance of getting into like a place like Netflix or these places than you do." But when you get in, I want to act in it. That's all I am as an actor. And then Mike Madsen, you spoke to him, Tommy, right? I was on the phone with Mike Madsen. He hooked me up for like an hour and a half. And it's just like Sonny Black. He played the movie. Well, this is a funny story. Now I'll tell you real quick. We go to the uh, to the Oscars. Now we can't get into the Oscars because you know I'm not nominated for anything. But he's there with the Green Book. We're, yeah, <laughs> uh, yeah that, well, that was uh, yeah for uh, Craig, my fellow hitman. But anyway, we're at the after parties of the. Uh, the Oscars and the one before, I guess it was the Golden Globes. And anyway, he's sitting there. He's we're at the table, did a table together. And this guy is eavesdropping on us. So I start, he looks to me like Joe Sapp. He really looks like Joe Sapp. So <laughs> I start calling him Joe Sapp. And he's looking. I said, come on over. You might as well just sit with us. The guy comes over. Now we don't want to leave. He's listening to our stories. He's listening to Madsen. Finally, Madsen grabs a butter knife. 
and there's a picture of him trying to cut his ear off. Like in <laughs> uh, Reservoir Dogs, remember? Right. <laughs> yeah. So they, they, finally uh, we get rid of the guy, but he thought I just nicknamed him Joe Sapp. He didn't know. He, <laughs> he says, you had this guy eating out of your hand. And then he tells me, I felt like we were in a movie scene together. You called the guy over, he comes over. <laughs> He's a real regular guy, too. La Larry, what was the song that was playing in the Reservoir Dogs when he was in the middle, stuck, stuck in, the in the middle with you? That's right. <laughs> Yeah. Well, oh, I only asked one I question. You got it right. Yeah. 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 Well, Armand's real busy now. Michael Madsen ran on hard times. I mean, he, his house burned down during those fires. He lost like 17 motorcycles, 30 Rolexes, uh, 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 an artist, a paint. What do you call it? A paint collection. You know, a lot of that was not insurable. So he needs worry. He needs to get back to work, too. I feel bad for him, but, you know, uh, Hopefully this pandemic ends and we're all working soon. For sure. Uh, you know, Tom, Tom, maybe I'm going to play Tommy in, in Friends of the Family. Yeah. I, I just got to dye my hair. If I dye my hair, I look younger. I'm getting well, older. listen, guys, I think that we got to uh, put an end, you know, end the show right now, even though I, we could probably talk for hours. And I want to thank Larry Mazza. Thank you so much. And, thank you know, I, I, when I realized I had met you before yeah. – I went through my archives of my pictures and I pulled that up and I said, Oh, that's, that's him. You know, uh, the, the, I was the premiere of the perfect murder. I was in that with Phil Grimaldi, who you also met that night. Yes. yes. And Tommy Dades, you're the man, you're a great guy. I got to get together for dinner. hundred percent. Well, thank right? you. I don't got any bling though to wear into Brooklyn. You know, I'm going to have to, <laughs> I want to be there. I want to be there. I'll come up and meet you guys. But that, would, that would be great. Actually, and please invite us on again. I'm speaking for Tommy, but I want to come on again. So I'm I, sure. I would love to have you both on again because we only scratched the surface, you know? Yeah, we need more time. For all you police off the cuff fans, real crime stories, you saw Larry Mazza and Tommy Dades. Thank you so much for paying attention and listening. Take Good night. Care, buddy. Thank you. Good night now. Talk to you later.